customer success, like any other kind of organization or function, um, suffers the effects of things that are happening around it. And so that chapter for me was um, was a good challenge because I had to kind of factor in all that unpredictability. I think I actually start the, the first page of the whole book, really making an, an indictment of customer success, saying that, um, you know, everyone talks about metrics and everyone says they're tracking metrics. Then why, if that's all true, then why has customer success suffered so much hardship in the last two years? We bombard our CSMs with a lot of information. You should be doing all these things. And, and here's why you should be doing all these things. But, but there's almost like there's, there's too much. And so the onus is on the leaders to, to contain it into some, something that's manageable, a system that's manageable for the CSM so they can actually do their job with a minimal amount of noise. Not a lot of leaders are good at the other part, which is to use the health score internally to educate and to help those other organizations understand the work that they could do to improve the health of these customers. I think it's a wasted opportunity. Hello and welcome to the Scale Tale podcast, your go-to podcast for insights, strategies, and interesting stories to help you drive effective customer success. I'm Mosmi, and I have a fantastic episode lined up for you today. I have an amazing guest, Peter Armali. He's a CS leader with 35 years of experience in IT operations, software sales, service delivery. He's done it all. Peter has worked with companies like Valueize, Oracle, Eloqua, PFC Software, and has deep insights in customer engagement strategies. He lives in Toronto with his wife, Mamie, and their dog, Blackjack. That's an amazing name for a dog. Right. And anyway, I'm a great fan of him and his new book, Mastering Customer Success. Discover tactics to decrease churn and expand revenue. Peter, that's a top. That's an amazing name for a book. You know, just bang on for customer success. So, welcome to the podcast, and it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. My first question that I always ask every guest: How are you? And how did you land up in customer success? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm really good. I'm I'm. Fine, thank you, Mosmi, and thanks for uh, inviting me onto the podcast. It's really a, a thrill to be here. Um, and so, uh, you know, how I landed in customer success was, uh, I want to say by accident, but when I look back, it, it wasn't really, I, I think it, it was kind of destiny in a way. Uh, when I was in pre-sales as a solution consultant, I was, I realized I was really good um, with customers, like in front of customers, working closely with customers. Um, and I didn't, <clears throat> despite the role, the role was all about trying to help sales sell solutions, and I was good at that. Um, but I, I was always interested in, in understanding how the customers behaved with the product afterwards. So I would stay in touch with customers and provide assistance. This is before customer success. So in a way, I was kind of like conducting myself as a customer success manager in addition to a solution consultant. And, and I became really good at that. And I touch on that in the book a little bit. Some of my anecdotes that I relate um, touch on that period of time. And, and then I, I just decided I want to get closer to the product and the customers who use it. So I moved into the post-sales world of premier support, ran premier support for a number of years. And then um, we started up a service called Technical Advisory Service, which is essentially a forerunner to customer success at BMC Software. And that's where I really understood uh, the mechanics, um, the, the vast architecture that's required, all the intimate knowledge you need to know about the product and customers to really excel in the role of customer success. And it, I just kind of kept moving in that direction and really was excited by it and became really passionate um, um, evangelizer in the industry. I started really talking about it uh, in the industry probably about 12 years ago, and I haven't stopped since then. Oh, I, I am so happy that you are people with your depth of experience need to talk more about customer success. And I'm so glad that you wrote the book. What I really want to know is what was the vision towards, you know, when you started thinking about, and I know it's a painful process to write a book. It's a really long process. And what was the vision when you started to write this book? What was the audience? What was the reason? What was the core idea behind it? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I, it's important to say that I was approached to write the book. Uh, I've been, I've made an attempt to write a book a few years ago with, with some colleagues uh, at Oracle. Um, it, it, it progressed, but collapsed um, just because people have different kind of priorities and stuff. And so we couldn't corral the, the energy uh, all together at the same time. So we just stopped. And but I've always wanted to write a book. Well, I've been really interested in writing a book about customer success for some time. And I do a lot of writing uh, in the industry anyways, lots of articles, um, lots of stuff on LinkedIn. I do a lot of uh, talks and speeches and that sort of thing. And so um, it's become a, it became a really strong interest. And, and um, PAC-T, the, the publishing company, just reached out to me last September and said, hey, we've been thinking about branching out from our um, our core capability, which is uh, they publish books around technical mm -hmm. technical programs and technical projects and topics. Um, and we think customer success is the right topic that kind of blends the world of business and technical. And I thought, okay, that makes total sense. And they said, we'd love you to be a writer. And we'd like you to write with someone else. Uh, so two authors. And I, I, I've never met Jeff Mark. So he's my, my co-author of the book. And we became fast friends. Um, and so what really motivated me for some time was really get my thoughts onto, onto, into a book mm -hmm. um, where they're concentrated. And it's not exhaustive. There's lots more things I think about with customer success, but they're good. the book does a good job of encapsulating most of my ideas and Jeff's ideas on what the fundamentals are for customer success managers. And to answer your question, who's the audience? It really is customer success managers. And the reason why we're so passionate about pursuing this project is because we felt, as we looked at the landscape of books out there about customer success, they're all almost universally targeting leadership. And, and that's good. I mean, I've read them all. I've got them looking at my bookshelf here and they're all there. Um, and they're all good books, but we felt there was a, a market that's been missing, which is ironically the customer success managers themselves who are on the front line. They get a lot of guidance Customer success managers, generally speaking, over LinkedIn, through leadership, through conversations that they have, through the communities, all those wonderful things. But there's no book that I know of that is very comprehensively speaking to them. And, and more, more specifically, we're targeting customer success managers who want to grow in the role. So we say at the outset of the book, this is for customer success managers who are in the role, who want to grow, who want to get more excellent in what they do, and not necessarily to become leaders or formal managers and directors, but to just be really great in the role. And that's, and that's really essentially why we wrote the book. I, I have read some of it. I should be honest. I haven't completed it. I just started reading some sections that I really enjoyed. And I think a lot of personal experience that you bring in the book, that makes everything so much alive and it seems that you know many sections you take a very strong stand of what you believe that i believe this is right even though there may be so we'll di we'll dive into that but before we go ahead what are the chapters or sections that you really really feel very strongly about i'm sure you love all the chapters i mean you wrote it but yeah so you know that's a great question what's my favorite part of the book um so it's important to point out that Five of the chapters are written by me, five by Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've we each have read each other's parts, of course. And so we're we're really like reading each other's work. Um, and it was a, it was actually very enjoyable to write the book. It was a lot of work, a lot of pressure, but it was fun too. Um, but I would have to say, as I look at the book, um, it probably might not surprise people who have read a lot of my stuff and have talked to me. That my favorite part is the last chapter, which is really about the exciting future of customer success. That's what the title is. And um, and why that's my favorite, I think, is because the future is super unpredictable. Um, and there's so much happening right now, obviously, not just with customer success and the, let's call it turmoil that it's been facing mm -hmm. over the last two years, but just generally broadly at large in the business world and the whole world of all of our societies are going through a lot of change and it's everything's impacting everything else there's nothing you can kind of take separately and say it's 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 divorced from everything else customer success like any other kind of organization or function um, suffers the effects of things that are happening around it and so that chapter for me was um 
was a good challenge because I had to kind of factor in all that unpredictability um, and instability that's happening um, and still try to provide a hopeful vision for customer success managers that they've chosen the right profession and here's why. And, and the book is all about really focusing on the fundamentals, becoming excellent at the fundamentals and how that will serve you going forward uh, in the face of all this instability. And it might not even be in a role of customer success, but the, but the, the fundamentals of customer success will serve you well in whatever other kind of profession or occupation you go into. I've, I've shown this book to friends who know nothing about customer success. And they say, they look at it, they kind of scan it and say, well, what you're talking about here is stuff that is, is, is really relevant for a lot of different fields, you know, customer okay. service, obviously, but just anyone who wants to be good at their job um, and really kind of have the right kind of discipline to improve in their roles. So, you know, I, th I think, um, I, if, if people who don't know customer success pick that up from the book, I think we've done a good job, Absolutely. in other words. And so that last chapter for me is, uh, it's like a hopeful chapter, uh, even though a lot of it is kind of like scary. If, you know, we talk about uh, things that are happening that you have no control over, um, but the things you do have control over is how you attack your skills how you attack your desire to improve. Those things are totally in people's control. And that's what that final chapter is really about. Well, I look forward to reading the last chapter. I haven't reached there. So <laughs> that's a good one that you picked the last chapter. So I look forward to reading it and where customer success is going. Having a startup in customer success, I am very hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed, of course. <laughs> so the chapters that I find very interesting okay, for me, Especially. And I think that, as you said, and you very rightly said that it is not just CS, but it applies to a wider range of businesses, mm -hmm. right? And that got me thinking. So the first chapter is uh, that you wrote is optimizing your key metrics for growth. And in that chapter, you dive deep into how to put those metrics together, how to put it together for a team. And it sort of got me thinking how I can get, you know, as a founder, my entire team to be aligned towards business and not to set up goals for individuals, not just CS, but the whole team. And to have goals with the entire team, looking at the future of the business and rather than just their individual pockets, which sort of has always helped. And that's the objective of putting ESOPs and all of these things. But how you've put it together is so beautifully set in terms of aligning customer value and then going deeper into, of course, customer success, qualitative and quantitative. So I would really like you to talk a little bit about that. I find it very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the metrics piece, I think I actually start the, the first page of the whole book, really making an, an indictment of customer success, saying that, um, you know, everyone talks about metrics and everyone says they're tracking metrics. Then why... If that's all true, then why has customer success suffered so much hardship in the last two years, having to prove itself um, to CFOs and to senior executives and, and to the rest of the business, uh, the companies, business, like business organizations to say, you know, we are valid, we are important. Um, if, we're, if we're tracking metrics all that time, the, the proof should have been there. Um, the argument should have been already made uh, that those, and then it, there, there should have been fewer questions about the, the purpose and the value of customer success. If in fact people were tracking the right metrics and, and recording the right metrics and proving that those metrics matter to the outcomes that they're committed to produce for customers and to the company. So my argument is, okay, you can say, you know, the indictment of the industry is you're saying all these things, but it's not actually happening at least not effectively, because otherwise that's, that's, those, that scenario of the last two years would not have been so intense. So um, yeah, the, the, the first chapter is a, a very complex chapter, I find, because we talk about a lot of the fundamentals. Everyone knows about smart, smart goals and smart metrics and all those kinds yes. of things. And that's the, those are for all, for all kind of organizations and, and most business functions understand that it's a good way, very basic way of, of being people that are measuring themselves against certain kind of very kind of 
specific kind of um, ways to track your behavior right. and your performance. Um, but I try to kind of connect all that to um, the ability, the ability to eventually connect it to the delivery of the successful outcomes for customers, and in a continuum of what that means for the customer lifetime value. So the chapter yes. also touches on that critical um, metric as well, which isn't often discussed or explored or definitely not kind of like committed to by most customer success organizations. People know what it means, but I would argue that hardly anyone's doing really a good job of tracking and, and improving the customer lifetime, lifetime value um, through the metric. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, I'm not trying to kind of minimize effort there. I'm just trying to expose that that's important over time. And what that also reveals, the chapter reveals is, um, you know, these things, metrics, uh, they require patience. Yes, and the, the unstated mm -hmm. part of that chapter is, it's also an indictment of leadership that, you know, we, we bombard our CSMs with a lot of information. You should be doing all these things. And, and here's why you should be doing all these things. But, but there's almost like there's, there's too much. And so the onus is on the leaders to, to contain it into some, something that's manageable, a system that's manageable for the CSMs so they can actually do their job with a minimal amount of noise. And so the, the first chapter really is a challenge to the leadership of CS to get your act in order and figure out how you can make the CSM's job more streamlined using those fundamentals of like smart goals, um, the very basic things like smart goals and metrics like customer lifetime value to provide a longer term vision for how these goals um, should be kind of pursued with that objective in mind. I think the chapter connects very nicely with strategy, business strategy, to customer value, to financial metrics, going to LTV and CLTV, and building that connection, which sort of starts somebody thinking towards how you can prove your value within the organization. You know, I am always amazed by this thought process. And I think that's what the genesis of all this issue with CS is that somehow there's a perception that renewals just happen. Yeah. They don't happen. <laughs> there is somebody putting so much effort for that to happen. And you you so rightfully said that, you know, we've done all the work, but we've not put it together and presented it the right story of the effort mm -hmm. that goes. You're handling 80, 90% of the revenue, but you haven't been able to put in the language that the business or a CFO understands as to what value you're bringing on the table. And that entire thread that you tie in the first chapter and all the areas that you put together, it's absolutely brilliant. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, there's a lot of um, effort made into that sort of consistent kind of thread uh, through not just the chapter, but through the book. It's a real challenge. I'm but I said to explore that. To our editors. Sorry. I'm still to explore the rest of the threads going forward. I've been through a few chapters, but I still have to go forward. Yeah. Uh, another uh, part of the book that I found very interesting, uh, Peter, was that in the book, you take a very strong stand in leveraging data for customer success. I think in that you take a very strong stand uh, earlier on, actually, that there is a lot of talk about customer health not being a good indicator and people have doubts and concerns and you know there's a lot of trust issues let's say with that mm -hmm. number and you take a very strong stand that yes I understand but it's very important so I I would really like to talk about a little bit of your point of view from that yeah I feel that the ongoing conversation um, isn't really fair because I think people take a stance and about customer health, um, the, the, the health scoring system, and say it's garbage because we never got it to work or I've never seen it work. And so it means it's useless and irrelevant. And why are people building these things? Very few people, in my opinion, have made kind of really cogent arguments why it's not good. Um, 
But the, I, I feel like the people who've made arguments why it matters and why it should be pursued, I've done a lot of work to understand how important it is. And so it's not just a matter of making your customer health score um, sophisticated, that, that's important. Um, it's not just a matter of maintaining an ongoing basis, basis, that's also important. It's also important that whoever um, leading the customer success organization understands that part of their job is, is communications. A big part of their job is communication, not just with their team, but externally. And part of the job is to ensure that information about customers is communicated very, very effectively throughout the, well, throughout the company. And an easy way to get an audience with other organizations is to put a health score in front of people and say, these accounts are yellow or red, and it, it provokes a reaction. And I think you'd want to do that to start the conversation. Sometimes it, the doors are closed to you unless you provoke a conversation. And the, I've always found the customer health score is a wonderful way to initiate a conversation. So my argument is customer health scores are, if you do them well, are can be very accurate for, for assessing the health of customers. I've done it. I've, I've worked with lots of co companies who, who have done it. I worked, I've worked for different consultancies now, and I've seen it many, many times. It's a lot of work, but there's a lot of value to having it done well and to maintaining it. And I would also argue that not a lot of leaders are good at the other part, which is to use the health score internally to educate and to help those other organizations understand the work that they could do to improve the health of these customers. I think it's a wasted opportunity to yes, say, yes. let's get rid of these things. Okay, so there's a vacuum, then what? That's my, that's my answer, ask uh, my question back to these people. Okay, then what if you remove the health scores? It, it reminds me of one of the quotes I read that, you know, if something is not measured, it can never be improved. Yeah. So if, if you're not doing the step one, even if, you know, you doubt the measurement, at least it shows you an indicative number. And that's not bad. It you know, at, a picture at, and at, you can polish it over time. Yeah. You know, at, at Oracle, I was a big evangelist of the health scores. And, and so the senior executives would say to me, there's too much strife there's too much kind of like irritation that these things produce they, no one no one wants to believe them and i said well that's not a reason to get rid of them that's a reason to uh, have a conversation but to say it bothers sales that customer success is producing producing health scores that they that they question or that they disagree with that doesn't mean you stop right so i i could never get a, an executive to give to to really kind of probe themselves <laughs> why they felt that way but i do believe that you know when when you are talking or you're trying to highlight issues and concerns it's very hard to do it without having some metrics or numbers on the table because mm -hmm. then it becomes completely opinion right i believe the customer is not doing good somebody else believes the customer is doing good it's it's opinions it means shit sorry but it does not mean anything, right? Yes. But if if you're putting certain metrics on the table, you yeah. can doubt about the measurement, but then all your customers are measured on the same metrics, right? So yeah. it is giving you a number which is comparative to across the board, and it is giving you a number that makes sense. Yes, this guy is better, and the other one is not so good as the other customer. So A is better, B is not. That cannot be argued. You can always argue that no, A is not better, A is amazing. I get it. Okay, but as a comparison, it still makes sense and you can at least have that conversation. Yeah. It's even getting that started. Yeah, the, the health score, uh, a really good health score will be as scientific as it can possibly be. Uh, it'll be something that's um, the, the various kind of metrics used to produce the health score are as objective as they possibly can be. That's why I'm not a big fan of subjective inputs like the, the sentiment of CSMs or the sentiment of an account manager, you know, those, 
I guess those are interesting, but at the end of the day, I've never factored them in really highly, even if I highly respected the CSM and the account manager, because that's just a point of view, as you said, that's just an opinion. It might matter. It matters to a conversation, but if you're talking about a something that's going to score a, a company, um, then you know you need something that's going to be able to be tested, um, something that's measurable. You can't really yes. measure someone's opinion like and aligning so with business outcomes or goals right because even if i might love my customer but my customer may not stay because they're not achieving the value they wanted that's that's true that's the final arbiter <laughs> <laughs> thanks peter i think we are almost time and i okay. really really enjoy it and i look forward to also talking to jeff he has some sort of infectious energy in his conversation. Oh yeah, yeah. He's a, <laughs> he's, he was, he and I were wonderful kind of partners because we're very different. Um, I'm, you know, I used to be a CSM many, many, many years ago. I've been more executive um, leader, architect for many, many more years than that. Um, and recently, I've just been really more in consulting. Uh, so, but he's he's in the role. Um, and in a really passionate way. Jeff's going to be a good interview for you because he's super passionate and very smart about all this stuff. I, I, I'm so glad I met you and I got to meet Jeff as well. So what's next for Peter? So I'm, I recently joined Valueize, uh, which is a consultancy advisory firm uh, focused not just on customer success. So it's important to say we look at the whole life cycle of a customer. Mm -hmm. So that's what really excites me about the company. Um, we try to help companies understand how they can optimize the various um, phases of the journey, um, you know, not just with that customer success control, but other parts of the company too. And so I want to focus on really helping valueize clients um, become excellent at that. But at the same time, I am getting asked if, if there's another book um, on the horizon. And, and that's there's a couple my question. Of yeah, there's there's someone I used to work with uh, many years ago at Oracle, and she and I have talked often about collaborating on a book, and, and the timing is is now coming near for her to be ready to do that. And so we're going to start exploring that. Hopefully, that would be something we could do. But there's even a solo book is something I've been kind of percolating in my brain too. So, so Peter, the you know the parts that I have read and the conversations that I've had with you, I just feel that there is so much more that is still not written. And the depth of experience that you have, I think that needs to come out. It will be great for everybody who gets an opportunity to learn from your experiences and your mistakes as well. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, my career has been long. I feel like I've done a lot of different things. You know, when I look at people talk about go to market, and I, I'm proud to say I've worked in every single one of those organizations. I've worked in sales, I've worked in support, I've worked in customer success, I've worked in product, I've worked in services, <laughs> you know, and some of that was by accident. Some of that I was invited to be part of those organizations and and, um, and I'm grateful for all those experiences. A lot of it was hard. Um, some of it was like contentious, um, a lot of it, um, but you learn from all those things. And, and I feel like at this point, stage i would like to share a lot of that um, those experiences with people to your point Elizabeth. yes yes we i and i'm sure a lot of other people who would read your book will look forward to the next edition because you talk at the level of operators mm -hmm. and how they can excel in their day-to-day -day job with all the experiences and personal stories that you bring in into the book i think that is extremely valuable because then you know you can really speak to the person at their level and that's yeah very, very that's good I'm, I'm glad i'm glad that's a takeaway for you because that was the that was what we hope to communicate um i mean obviously jeff is in the role so how he communicates is probably super relevant to the reader but I, i'm glad you said that about what how i might be coming across because that was uh, very intentional on my part and it's not it's not hard for me to do because i often take um, the point of view of the underdog um, in in situations. And I feel like CSMs, again, are bombarded with information and expectations and shifting expectations a lot. And so, and they, their jobs are precarious. And so there's so much pressure and stress on them. And I feel like 
and this is no secret. I mean, I'm a leader, um, but I feel like leaders could do more. You know, yes. um, executives could do way more uh, to help their people um, in their careers. And I think a lot of them are, you know, shamefully not doing a great job at that. So I think there's a lot of work there. Um, that's a leadership book I'd love to talk that I maybe write about. <laughs> So at the end of the podcast, you know, I do like to mention an example that you wrote, and I think it speaks to me so strongly, where you compare a CSM with a flight navigator. Is that the term? Is the term right? What, what did I compare it to, sir? You compared a CSM with a person who is like at the last mile in a flight and a problem comes and the pilot calls at the navigator and says, this is the problem. And the guy cannot make a mistake, has to, oh, has to get it. Home. Yeah, every, all, everything's on. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the analogy was with um, Gene Krantz, who is the flight director of Apollo mm -hmm. uh, 13. Uh, that ill-fated mission that didn't make it to the moon and had to come back, limping back to Earth. And there was a lot of like chance they, they would never return. Uh, and, and as the flight director in Houston, they had the final say. They had the final decisions to make. And, and he related afterwards, there was so much pressure yes. to make the right decision for him. And that, so I compare that to CSMs often being told, okay, this is your job. This is how you do your job. And you better not make a mistake. They don't, leaders don't say that, but the way they, uh, the pressure is on them sometimes, not all of them, but sometimes I've, I've met CSMs who have like, that's a tremendous amount of pressure to have to make that decision. And you're getting blamed or your, your organization's getting blamed for the, for that company, uh, you know, leaving or shredding, churning um, and are not, not expanding. And what if, why did customer success fail? And we all know just as in, in uh, you know Apollo missions, there's so many elements that have yes. to come together for a perfect mission and, and customer success to have truly successful customers. It's, it's not so just a things. success organization, it's the whole company that has to come together with precision to make that customer successful. And too often uh, these days, that's not the case, is that customer success is the, the sole uh, organization to blame for, for failure. I think it's a beautiful analogy, you know, that if something is successful, you know, a renewal happens, it's expected. But if a customer goes, that's what gets highlighted. That's a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a good balance. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks a lot for being part of the podcast. It was just <laughs> wonderful to talk to you today. And I learned so much. I'm sure it would be insightful for all our listeners as well. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun talking with you too, Nozzy. Bye for now. And thanks to all the listeners for joining us in today's podcast. If you like to connect to Peter on LinkedIn, I'll provide you all the links in the description. I've also provided the link for Peter's new book, Mastering Customer Success. Go check it out. It's an amazing book for anyone who's passionate about customer success. I myself have read half of it. I hope that I'll be able to finish before I get to talk to Jeff. And if you like the podcast, feel free to follow and subscribe. We are available on all major podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, YouTube. See you in the next episode soon. Thanks, Peter. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye.